And so before we start our passage in James, we have to establish um, what does wealth mean? And because this passage talks about the wealthy, it talks about people who are in humble circumstances or people who um, are not as well off financially, I think it's helpful to first establish what does that mean? Who are the wealthy um, and who are the poor? And so in the past couple years, there have been many, many moments in my life where I wondered, what would it be like if I had more money? Um, wouldn't my life be easier? Like, wouldn't I be so much more happy if I had more money? And one day, um, when I was kind of hitting a low in this moment, I was on YouTube watching a documentary called The Rich Kids of Instagram. And so if you haven't seen this documentary, it basically shows the lives of these super, super uber rich um, kids around the world. And they have so much money that they could go into the mall and they could just drop $5,000 at the mall without thinking twice about it. They can literally hold stacks of money and make it rain in their room. It's just like the most, the epitome of wealth. And so as I was watching this, I was like, wow, like what would it be like um, to be that wealthy? Like what would my life be like? But after that, I got on Google and I did a little research. And as I was Googling in the world wealth distribution, I stumbled upon this calculator. And if you type in your annual income, it will tell you where you rank kind of on the world wealth distribution. And so I typed in my annual income and I clicked submit and then I was shocked <laughs> and very humbled. Um, so basically, if you make more than $27,000 in US dollars, guess what percentage of the world wealth you fall in? So you can just guess in me. Oh, yeah, t t tell us. 10. OK, any other guesses? Three. Three. OK, so if you make more than $27,000 USD, you fall in the top 2% of the world's wealth distribution. And if you look at that in terms of like American US wealth distribution, if you as an individual, um, not a household, but as an individual make the same amount, $27,000 or more, you fall in the top half um, of the US wealth distribution. And so as I was stumbling upon this information, I was like, wow, even though I might think um, that I'm not wealthy when I watch these YouTube documentaries about the uber, uber, super rich, I was like, wow, actually most of us in this room, many of us, we actually are extremely wealthy, especially in terms of the world wealth in distribution, but even in terms of the US. Um, many of us in this room are actually very wealthy. And so I think that is some helpful context and information to keep in mind as we go into this text. Because as James is talking about the wealthy and the poor, it's helpful for us to be able to kind of place ourselves, um, not just how we feel, whether we feel wealthy or not, but you know, numerically <laughs> speaking, like where do we actually fall um, in that spread? And so we're going to dive right into our passage. And so if you have a Bible on you and you like to look things up, um, you can turn to James 1, verse 9 through 11. It's again James chapter 1. Do we have it on the screen too? No. Okay. Well, I will read it multiple times, so you'll hear it. <laughs> okay, James 1, 9. It says this. Believers in hum humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed, and in the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. The word of the Lord. And so in this short passage, it's only three verses, we have this striking imagery of these wildflowers that grow up and when the scorching sun comes, the flowers are scorched and they fall away and they're destroyed. And so I think actually living in Texas, we are like the perfect audience for <laughs> this imagery. If we have any Texas wildflower fans in here. <laughs> yeah, so I'm from Ohio originally. We don't have, we obviously don't have Texas wildflowers here. So this was kind of a new thing for me moving to the state. But when the Texas wildflowers spring up, 
feel like people go crazy. If you know the area kind of around the, between the Civic Center um, and 75, there's these huge wildflower patches that spring up, and I see people there, like they're bringing their children, they're putting their children in the middle of the patches, they're taking pictures of them. Um, people are talking about the wildflowers that are on the side of the highway. Um, they're in our parks, and people are running through them. The wildflowers here in Texas are really beautiful um, things that we get to look forward to each year. They're a marker of the season. Um, but that's because the wildflowers are seasonal. Now, if you've lived here for really any length of time, you know that Texas summers are scorching. Every year um, when the summer hits, I'm like continually shocked of just how hot the summer sun is. It feels like, you know, the sun is beating down on your face and your flesh is just like melting off your bones. It's just so hot. And so when the summer sun comes and hits these beautiful wildflowers, these wildflowers, they don't stand a chance. And as the summer sun continues to beat on them day after day, eventually they are going to wither and shrivel and fall off and die. And so that is what James is saying will happen to the wealthy among us, which again is many of us here. He says that even while the rich go about their business, they are going to fade, um, just like the beauty of these wildflowers is destroyed. And so I know that's not how a lot of us or how our society um, thinks about people who are wealthy or people who are poor. Um, we actually think pretty oppositely of that um, in our hearts and in our society oftentimes. Oftentimes, um, we have stereotypes of the rich, and when we see people who are wealthy, we assume that they are hardworking, that they deserve kind of the position they achieved in society. We assume that they're intelligent, that they follow the law, that they have good moral character. We assume oftentimes that they are trustworthy. But a lot of times in our society and in our hearts, when we see people without wealth, people who are poor, we oftentimes assume the opposite. We have stereotypes where we think the poor are lazy, that they deserve the kind of the position they have in society. They might be morally delinquent, they might be less intelligent. And again, these are oftentimes assumptions that we have um, that are not necessarily true. And a lot of times too, when we think about the poor, maybe we don't assume um, that they are less intelligent or morally delinquent, but sometimes we have this idea where we see them as children that we have to save. And a lot of times we have this impression about the poor in other parts of the world. Sometimes we think, well, they can't you know, raise themselves out, out of poverty, um, so we have to go in there and save them and kind of make decisions for them um, and give them a chance to succeed in life. And this is actually can be pretty dishonoring too if we take away people's age agency um, and their ability to kind of choose what is helpful for them in their communities. And so a lot of times we follow this script that society kind of lays out for us of honoring people who are wealthy and assuming good things about them um, and dishonoring people who are poor and either assuming bad things about them um, or just assuming that maybe that they're more like children and they can't make decisions for themselves and so we have to swoop in and save them. But really both of these positions are dishonoring um, to people who have less access to wealth. And so James is really flipping this on its head and he is saying the opposite. He's saying that believers who are in humble circumstances, believers who are poor, should take pride in their high position. And then he's saying the rich should take pride in their humiliation, in their low position. And so he's really saying the opposite um, of what many of our hearts in society tell us um, to believe. And so to illustrate this, I want us to do an exercise. So I want you to pick up a hand, any hand, it doesn't matter which hand. <laughs> okay, now I want you to look straight ahead with your hand in the air and just look. Okay. That was the first exercise. Now we're gonna do exercise two. I want you to take that hand in the air and I want you to place it over an eye. Now I want you to look in the same spot that you were looking before and I want you to think, how has your sight been affected with this hand obstructing your vision? <laughs> okay, you can take your hand down. Okay, so who here thinks that you could see more accurately and more fully in the second exercise when your hand was in front of your eye. Okay. Now who here thinks that you could see more accurately, more completely and fully 
the first time when your hand was just in the air and not in front of your eye? Okay, wow, seems like this was a fairly unanimous <laughs> um, exercise. Okay, so I think this is what James is trying to do for us. James is saying, hey, guys, as human beings, as a society, we are not seeing reality fully. We are actually seeing with this obstructed vision, um, which makes us see the rich and the poor in different ways that may or may not be how God views them. And so James, as he's laying into the church community in this book, he is trying to show us like a clear picture of reality. He is trying to give us vision to see um, the rich and poor in their community and in their congregation with an unobstructed vi vision. He wants them to see them the way that Jesus sees them. And so how does Jesus see um, the poor? And so we're going to go a little bit backwards to Mark 10. And actually, unless you're a super visual learner and it's helpful for you to read, I'd actually prefer for you just to listen to Mark 10. We'll keep an element of surprise as we go through the story that way. But you can turn to Mark 10, um, 46. If that's helpful to you, that's fine. Um, Let's go to Mark 10. Okay, so this is back during the time when Jesus was walking the earth. And so as Jesus was walking the earth, doing his ministry, um, he would go from town to town, all over the countryside, and he would heal people, both spiritually, physically. He would restore them to society um, as people that could participate in religious life, as people that could participate economically. Um, he was bringing society to this level of restoration, where people were healed spiritually, physically, societally, in all of these different ways. And so we have this man named Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus, um, he has a really tough road um, to walk in life. So Bartimaeus is actually disabled. Um, he's blind. And so because he is blind, that obviously limits the economic opportunities that he has to participate um, in society. And so he is li getting through life as a beggar. And so when this story takes place, Bartimaeus is sitting on the side of the road um, begging. And that's the way that he is able to survive um, throughout life because he doesn't have family to take care of him. Um, society isn't doing anything to like provide care for him. So really just in all these different ways, like s socially, economically, healthcare wise, like Bartimaeus is in a really hard place here. And he's sitting on the side of the road begging. But Bartimaeus hears that there is this guy named Jesus, and he hears the stories of Jesus going around and healing people and restoring people. And so when Bartimaeus hears that Jesus is actually in town, in fact, Jesus is actually like right over there walking down the road. Bartimaeus like can't stop himself. He has to reach out and cry out to Jesus. And so as he hears that Jesus is walking down the road, he starts crying out and he says, wait, okay, <laughs> okay. And he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he keeps crying this out over and over because he can't see where Jesus is, right? Um, because he doesn't have the ability to see, but he knows Jesus is coming. So he keeps crying out over and over, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He cries out over and over and over again because he knows that this is his only shot. This is his only shot to be restored spiritually, but also physically and economically and socially um, to the society. And so Jesus is walking down the road and he's crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then the people around him actually start to get annoyed. And so this is what the passage says. It says that the crowd... The crowd is looking at him, and it says that many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. So again, you have this man, like so desperate, like this is his one chance to be healed. Um, but people are rebuking him and telling him to be quiet. You know, Bartimaeus, like don't bother him. Like don't, you know, don't get in the way. Like just be quiet. And so they're rebuking him. They're telling him to be quiet. But it says that Bartimaeus um, cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. He's not listening to what the crowd is telling him, even as they're rebuking him and telling him to be quiet. He says, no, this is my one chance. Like, Jesus is going to heal, hear me. And so then what happens? Jesus hears him. Jesus hears his cries. And it says 
that Jesus stopped and said, call him. Jesus stopped and said, call him. And so I want you to take a second to imagine yourself as Bartimaeus. I want you to imagine yourself just at the end of your rope. You really have nothing, and you have this chance um, to like receive healing and restoration. And even as you're crying out, the people around you are rebuking you. They're telling you to be quiet. The people around you don't care. So I want you to take a second and just imagine, how would you feel if you were in that situation? And so I know a lot of times when we read the Bible, we like to imagine ourselves as the characters that are in need, the characters that Jesus comes in to save and rescue. And for some of us here, that's true. I think some of us in this room are the Bartimaeuses of this story. Um, but I think that actually for many of us in this room, we're not the Bartimaeus crying out um, to be saved. We're actually the crowd. We're actually the crowd who is either ignoring um, or rebuking the people that are crying out to Jesus for this type of restoration. But when Jesus stops and pauses and says, call him, call Bartimaeus to me, the crowd shifts. There's a shift that happens in the way that the crowd sees Bartimaeus. And so they called him and they said, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. And so again, this crowd that one moment before was rebuking him and telling him to be quiet, as soon as they see the way Jesus sees him, when they see that Jesus stops and says, call him, their tune changes. And they say, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. They change and they begin to encourage the man. And they call him and lead him to Jesus. And so... It says that Bartimaeus immediately, he threw his cloak aside, he gets up, he like runs towards Jesus. I assume people are helping him find Jesus because again, Bartimaeus isn't able to see. Um, but he makes his way to Jesus. And then we see this moment where Bartimaeus is facing Jesus and Jesus asks him a question. He says, Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus says, Rabbi, teacher, I want to see. And then in that moment, Jesus says, go. Your faith has healed you. And immediately Bartimaeus received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. And so we see this moment where Bartimaeus receives this restoration. He had faith that Jesus could change things for him. He had so much faith that he was willing to cry out, even though everyone else was ignoring him or telling him to stop crying out. And so because of this, Bartimaeus makes it to Jesus, because Jesus paused and Jesus said, call him. And so Bartimaeus, because of his faith, because of his persistence, gets to have this encounter with Jesus where he receives not only spiritual healing, but also physical restoration. And again, as a man who was disabled and wasn't able to hold down a job, receiving your sight again would change everything you know, in that society. That changes your ability to have a job. That changes like, your economic standing. Like, that changes his whole life. And so in this moment of him getting to meet with Jesus, he receives complete you know, spiritual, societal, physical, everything, restoration. And so that is the kingdom of God. That's what happens when Jesus' kingdom breaks into our society. I said earlier um, that a lot of times in our society, in our hearts, um, the way that we view the poor and the way that we view the wealthy, um, we view the wealthy oftentimes with honor, and we view the poor oftentimes with dishonor. But that is not the way it works um, in Jesus' kingdom. And that is what James is trying to get us to see. He is trying to change our vision so that we can see um, the poor the way that Jesus sees them and that we can see our own wealth um, in perspective um, for what it is, for something that is just going to fade away when the Texas sun comes and scorches <laughs> um, the ground. And so the inbreaking of Jesus' kingdom changes everything. It changes our own hearts. It changes the way that we see others. Um, but it also then changes like the structures and relationships of society. It changes everything. So again, if we remember our little vision exercise of 
seeing with no hand in front of her eyes and seeing with a hand in front of her eyes. This is what James, and this is what Jesus is trying to do. He's trying to give us um, this clear picture of society. And so in Jesus' kingdom, this is what is possible. It is possible for the crowd to go from either rebuking the poor or ignoring them to being a group of people that encourage them and like draw them closer towards Jesus. Um, it means that a man whose voice, his voice and his faith was actually heard um, by Jesus and honored, and because of that, he was able to have spiritual, physical, economic, everything, restoration. The inbreaking of Jesus' kingdom affects the structures um, of society, and it affects our sight. And so I think for many of us here, we heard of a man named Anthony Bourdain who passed away this week. Um, he was a famous chef. He was a celebrated television producer. Um, but it was said of him that he, as he would travel around the world, that he would sit um, just outside somewhere in a village and he would eat the food um, of just a normal villager. He would eat that food with the same type of respect um, and interest as he would eat the food of a celebrated chef. And so I think that is a beautiful picture. And to, and to someone who saw people um, with this right type of vision, that saw everyone, just, like regardless of their economic position, with honor and respect and interest. And so that is the challenge for us this week. Um, if you are someone who is wealthy, again, not according to whether or not you feel wealthy, but according to like the numbers, um, if you are someone who is wealthy, that is the challenge for you this week, um, to check in on how you are viewing um, the people who are wealthy or people who are poor. Um, when you see them, do you make assumptions about them, or do you try to see them as Jesus sees them, as people who are to be honored and people who are to be heard and listened to? And so I actually want you to pull out your phone if you have it. Wow, pulling out our phones. <laughs> and I want you to put a note in your calendar for some day this week. Maybe it could be Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday. You can pick a day. Um, but I want you to just write in your, like in a reminder to just check in on how how do you see the poor? So you can, just, you can just write, like, how do I see the poor? It can just be that. Because I think whether we are going throughout our neighborhoods, um, whether we are driving through the city, but I think off, also oftentimes just even in the news cycle, um, we are constantly seeing people um, of different economic positions, and we are making assumptions about people and thinking of them. And so I want us to just check in sometime this week and just sit with ourselves and think about how am I seeing the poor? And just, yeah, check in with your heart and check in with your assumptions. I'll give you a second to put that in your phone. And as you check in with yourself this week, whether it's people that you're seeing in your neighborhood, in your city, or also on the news, I want you to think, is the way you're thinking of them honoring or dishonoring? As James says, you know, believers who are in humble circumstances should take pride in their high position. Um, the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. Is that how you're seeing people um, in your neighborhoods, in your cities, and on the news this week? That's what I want you to check in with. And I want you to think, too, um, yeah, when people cry out um, for change or for help, I think in the news, um, in our neighborhoods, we are constantly seeing people crying out for change, um, whether it is you know, people pushing for reform of education, immigration, um, access to food, you know, even people kneeling at football stadiums. When people are crying out um, for change, how do you respond? Are you someone who rebukes them and tells them to be quiet? Are you someone who just ignores it um, and looks the other way? Or when people are crying out for change, do you listen? Do you try to understand their perspective, try to understand the story that they're bringing? Do you honor their voice? Because again, with this crowd, we see a group of people who initially 
were annoyed that this guy was crying out. You know, they were just trying to see Jesus. Jesus is so cool and so awesome. They just wanted to see Jesus. They didn't want this blind beggar, like, you know, creating noise and kind of distracting them from getting to see Jesus. They wanted, you know, him to just be quiet, and that's why they rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But again, that's not how Jesus responded. When Jesus heard his voice, he stopped, and he said, call him. This man, this blind beggar that y'all want to be quiet, he's actually the reason I came. Like, he is the man that I want to talk to. He's the man that I came to bring restoration for. So when you see people in the news or in your neighborhood speaking up and asking for change in our church or in our society, do you rebuke them? Do you ignore them? Or do you listen? Do you listen and try to bring them before Jesus? And so again, I know many of us in this room are wealthy, and so that is our charge, is to think of how are we listening to people? Are we honoring the poor by listening to their voices and challenging our assumptions? Um, but I also know that there are many of us in this room too who aren't, who aren't wealthy and who wouldn't consider ourselves that and that are struggling um, financially in our lives. And so for those of us in the room that fall into that category, I think James is actually bringing in encouragement to us. He's saying that, hey, even though society may not see you in a high position, Jesus actually does. He sees you in a high position. He hears your voice. He honors you. He pauses even when everyone else is ignoring you or telling you to be quiet. He stops and listens to you. And he longs to bring restoration to you spiritually, um, but also in every, in every holistic avenue of life. And so if you are someone who is struggling um, financially and you're not falling into the wealthy category, James is actually bringing an encouragement to you. He's saying Jesus sees you, Jesus hears you, he honors you, and he wants to bring restoration. And again, this type of restoration um, doesn't happen unless we all get on the same page, until we all like, learn to see the way that Jesus sees. And so I hope as we go throughout this week that we can challenge ourselves we can check our assumptions and ask ourselves, are we seeing um, the poor with honor, as James tells us to? Um, are we c considering the fact that you know, we who are wealthy are going to fade away just like the wildflowers on a hot Texas summer day? <laughs> and that, that is the truth for, for many of us in this room. But the encouragement is that when we spend time with Jesus, when we see how he responds um, to those who have less economically our sight will change too. We can be like the crowd who goes from ignoring or rebuking the poor, from trying to silence them. As we encounter Jesus and sees how he responds to them, we can shift our vision. We can learn to see them as Jesus sees them. Um, and we can become people who actually encourage and elevate their voices and honor them um, by hearing their stories and, yeah, by seeing them as Jesus sees them. And so as we continue to go through the book of James this summer, we are going to continue to hit on these issues um, of the wealthy and the poor and a lot of other um, cool issues. But I think we can't hope to change the way that our church or our city or our society functions until we first learn to see correctly, to have the vision that Jesus um, has as he looks at society. And so that's why I think it's so important for us to first spend time checking how do we see people? How do we respond um, to their voices? That is the first step before we can hope to see other change happen um, in our congregation or city um, or society.